Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction. I look forward to our conversation, both Colin with you and uh, with those of you in the audience. So the question of can we have Martin Luther King's dream without his faith? You know, many people who have no belief in God at all are passionately committed to racial justice. And so do we need Christianity today to realize Martin Luther King's dream? Or, you know, as we said, is it just a matter of historical interest that Martin Luther King was so shaped by his Christian faith? You know, it's undeniable that Martin Luther King's own vision and purpose for fighting for equity and justice, not just for poor and African American children, but for oppressed children throughout the world, that it's tied to his understanding of the true meaning of Christianity and the ministry of Jesus Christ. From his sermon, Beyond Vietnam, which he gave on April 4th in 1967, and if you haven't read that sermon, I encourage you to Google it and read it in its entirety. It is amazing. Um, in its views around where America is around race and, and equity. And from, I'm just going to read some quotes from that. And he says, um, and I quote, My calling takes me beyond national allegiances. I have yet to live up to the meaning of my commitment to the ministry of Jesus Christ. To me, the relationship of this ministry to the making of peace is so obvious that I sometimes marvel at those who ask me why I'm speaking against the war. Or Vietnam. Could it be that they do not know that the good news, meaning the gospel, was meant for all men, for their children and ours, for black and white, for revolutionary or conservative? Have they forgotten that my ministry is to the obedience of the one who loved his enemies so fully that he died for them? As a faithful minister of this one, can I threaten them with death, or must I not share my life with them? Later in that same speech, he says, beyond the calling of race or nation or creed, this is a vocation of sonship and brotherhood. Because I believe that the Father, meaning God, is deeply concerned, especially for his suffering and outcast children. I come tonight to speak for them. We are called to speak for the weak, for the voiceless, for the victims of our nation, for those it calls the enemy, for no document of human hand can make these humans any less our brothers. And not only did he speak about, about um, his own, own uh, commitment to Christianity, but he talked about how we should think about our enemies and those who per persecute us. He said in that same speech, here's the true meaning and value of compassion and nonviolence. When it helps us see the enemy's point of view, to hear his questions, to know his assessment of ourselves, for, him, for this for from his view, we may indeed see the basic weakness of our own condition. And if we are mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of our brothers who are part of the opposition. Martin Luther's commitment to nonviolence is inextricably tied to his faith and trust in God. It's not just a moral stance or a higher ground. It's because of his faith that he fundamentally believes in the effectiveness of nonviolence and, more importantly, love for reconciliation. As he says, we have a choice today nonviolent coexistence or violent co annihilation. As he says, the call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one tribe, race, class, or nation is in reality a call for an all embracing and unconditional love for mankind. This, meaning love, is often misunderstood, misinterpreted concept, so readily dismissed as weak or cowardly. But it's, it has now become an absolute necessary force for the survival of man. That's what Martin Luther King says. And for Martin Luther King, nonviolence resistance would ultimately win the day because that's what the creator of the universe had set in place as a model for human flourishing, and decree that love is more powerful than hate. And if we remove the faith foundations of those beliefs, we can pursue nonviolent 
resistance, and nonviolent reconciliation, but will do so without the ultimate conviction that love will ultimately triumph over all. And in spite of the many failures of, of many Christian leaders of the time to stand up for racial inequity, Martin Luther King looked at America in 1960 and saw the need for more true Christianity, not less. As he said in his famous speech, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed, that creed that we hold truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. This truth of the equality of all human beings is foundational not just to American aspirations and for a just society, but also to international human rights movements. Historically, this was based in the Judeo-Christian tradition, but we only have to turn on the news to find that for so many beliefs, both religious and secular, don't hold that fundamental truth of human equity at their core. So what does it mean to live out the true meaning of our nation's creed that all human beings are created equal? Martin Luther King put it like this, and I quote, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly bring the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. True compassion is more than flinging a coin at a beggar, he says. It comes from seeing an edifice that produces beggars as needing restructuring. Jesus gave Martin Luther King a model for this person-centered society, a model for personal transformation, as he seeks to meet each individual where they are, understand the content of their character, and bring forgiveness and wholeness and reconciliation to their heart. Jesus gave Martin Luther King this model for nonviolent resistance, of loving their enemies and ultimately having victory with love over hatred. So why does Christianity have such a bad press among modern universities? You know, when I say I'm a Christian, you know, around my colleagues at Harvard, you know, they, they look at me and they think, how, how can that be? It conjures up a certain view of what that must mean to say that I'm a Christian, a view that they sometimes find at odds with who they see me as, as a professional and as an individual. When I say I'm a Christian, it also conjures up views of being closed-minded, anti-education, homophobic, xenophobic, judgmental. These are views that are often promulgated in the media about who Christians are. And there are certainly people who call themselves Christians that do these things. But as a professor of education, it would be very hard for me to be anti-education. As a researcher, I try very hard to not be closed-minded or judgmental, but to ask tough, tough questions and let my data speak to me and challenge my own thinking. As one who is a developmental psychologist who studies cultural beliefs and human development, it'd be very hard for me to be xenophobic or homophobic or not value diversity. And there's not a tension between my cultural beliefs and my drive to understand the diversity of the human experience but it's actually true Christianity that demands that I commit myself to loving those who are different from me. In my own research as a psychologist, I long to understand the intricacies of culture and ethnicity and its manifestations in human life. And understanding adolescent sense of purpose, not because it's interesting theoretically or it's meaningful from a policy or practice standpoint, but because it helps me see how God has created us in the beauty of diversity. If you go back to the Bible and look what Jesus did, he didn't try to convince anybody to become Christians. He modeled compassion. He expressed how we should love one another. If you go to Matthew 5, 43, and for those of you who are Christians, this will be a familiar verse to you. It says, you have heard that it was said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus engaged those who were disenfranchised and humble he grieved when things weren't right and people's potential was not realized. He was angry when people were taken advantage of. And he didn't place the blame on the past, but he gave us a vision for a better future. True Christianity results in unconditional love for those around us. 
the Christian understanding that we're each created in the image of God. So each of us reflects in our diversity a different aspect of God. And even though we all make mistakes and we all do things are wrong, that are wrong, people who persecute us still have something good in them. They still reflect the image of God. But we must separate true Christianity from its manifestations in a single culture, political, or government structure. And Christianity didn't originate within a single government structure. In fact, the first century Jews hoped that Christ would come and solve the political problems with Rome. They thought there would be a war, they hoped for a victory, and that Jesus and his followers would win and perhaps from positions of power might rule over others. But Jesus Christ had a different vision. He had a bigger vision of salvation. And he called his disciples to something greater and broader than their own political ideas. And with regard to their own political aspirations, they were, were sorely disappointed and disillusioned by the time that Jesus was crucified. And Jesus challenged the religious leaders of the day to be more compassionate and less legalistic. And he challenged the first century disciples who were Jews, whose identity as the chosen people were, was based in exclusivity. He challenged them to be inclusive and to embrace foreigners, to embrace the poor, to embrace the needy and the sick and the outcast. But since then, perhaps beginning with Constantine in the first century when Christianity became the religion of the empire, Christianity and expressions of Christianity became intertwined with political power. And with that political power often comes oppression, and it wasn't long after before oppression comes in the name of Christianity. And you get colonization, genocide, oppression, cultural destruction in the name of Christianity. But that was not what Christianity was intended to be. So for many, the expressions of Christianity become inextricably tied to Western cultural beliefs, so much so that some think that to become a Christian, you also have to become culturally Western. That's also not true. It's a terrible misconception. Christianity originated not in the West, but in the Middle East. And from the beginning, Christianity was empathically and by design multicultural. In fact, the first African to be converted to Christianity was described in Acts. And the New Testament goes on to describe the early church as decidedly equitable, multicultural, and multi-ethnic. Again and again, the Christian church was without hierarchy and without political structures. The Apostle Paul described the church like this. He said, there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. And that comes from Colossians. And in the last book of the Bible, in Revelations, there's a vision of the final state of the church, and it says there's a great crowd who no one could number from every tribe, language, and nation worshiping Jesus. All the cultures were preserved. The languages were preserved. We weren't designed to become the same, but we were designed to embrace our diversity. So why is Christianity so embracing of different cultures and ethnicities and people groups? And whereas there are many faiths that express the essential value of love and compassion, Jesus exemplified it differently. He exemplified it by being willing to die for both his friends and his enemies. His death and his ultimate re resurrection offer peace and reconciliation to us, to each other, and to God. He demonstrated the signs and miracles to confirm who, we, who he is and who he was. And then he did something completely different and completely unexpected. He chose to die the love of his enemies. From my own research on the understanding of ethnic differences and worldviews, and especially differences in parenting beliefs, we can see how worldviews are socialized and how what we believe comes to feel so real and so right and so universal and natural and inherent. And when it does, we have the tendency to see ourselves and our own beliefs as normal and to see differences as deficits. And this is part of how Western and cultural dominant expressions of Christianity that oppress rather than love become confused and intertwined with our understanding of true Christianity. The goal of socialization of children is to train them in the ways the beliefs and the values of society, and to do so so tightly that the child comes to see this as their point of reality. The more internalized the cultural goals and beliefs, 
the more seamlessly the individual fits into the society and the more successful they become. And this socialization begins immediately at birth. And our own parenting practices carefully and implicitly socialize these values. And because our belief systems are so deep and they color our views so completely, and our interpretations of the world are so deeply informed by those views, it's easy to judge those who are different from us. But Jesus calls us to be different. He calls us to step outside of that and encourages us to have compassion for those who are different, to embrace and love our enemies. And it's only through this compassion and love that we can truly achieve justice and equity. Martin Luther King and true Christianity charge us to embrace those who are different from us in ways that we're not inclined to do so on our own, and to forgive each other in ways that we wouldn't do ordinarily. Martin Luther King said, no matter how low somebody sinks in racial bigotry, he can still be redeemed. And one journalist wrote in response to that quote, his opponents hate him for it. It's bad enough to be beaten, but it's worse to be forgiven, is what the journalist said. And Dr. Martin Luther King said, do what you will, and we will still love you. One day we shall win freedom, but not just for ourselves. We sh shall so appeal to your heart and conscience that we will win you in the process, and our victory will be a double victory. Is there a worldview that offers a better foundation than this, than the model of Jesus, the one who helps us trust that we can embrace those who are different from us and through humility and love change the hearts of people? Is there a better worldview? Perhaps there is, but I, I don't know of it. I can't imagine it. Thank you. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.